Okay, now that all of you believe the Bible is inspired and inerrant and that uh, we have the right books and we have accurate copies, now we're at the final stages of bibliology where now we can do, uh, we can do theology well, okay? But we have a few, few, few tasks ahead of us because to get to, uh, to properly to single source methodology, in theology, and single source, as I explained uh, initially in module one, single source means sola scriptura. It means that the Bible is the ultimate say on all that it addresses, it's fully inspired and errant, and it's sufficient and clear for building our system. And again, that, that ends up being ultimately, the, the, I mean, the ultimate principle of the Protestant Reformation is sola scriptura, because by using scripture alone as the final say, with tradition, great teachers, or the magisterium secondarily used and being tested by scripture, that's how we got salvation by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, to the glory of God alone. Okay, it's scripture alone or sola scriptura that provided the correction for, you know, again, as Protestants, we love our, our, our Catholics and Orthodox brothers and sisters, but the fact is we disagree in methodology. We're not going to apologize for that. So, so that said, our final stages here, once we've got all those other things in place is, my guess is you know, for all of you, even if you're Talbot students, you may have had a little Greek and Hebrew. You're not fluent in it, Okay. You're not walking around with just your Greek and Hebrew Bibles uh, and saying, "Yeah, boy, I can read this stuff fluently and know all the, uh, you know, all the details and the scholastic grammar behind it." No, you don't. Okay, because uh, very few people are at that level in their Christian life. So most of us need what a good translation of the Bible, and so the idea of translating these accurately copied uh, again uh, scriptures into a usable language becomes the next issue. So how do we translate it and then use that as the sole and ultimate source to build our theology? That's what this module is about. Now, that said, Geisler and Nix have a lot on the concept of translation. So you will look at that because when you're doing ministry, and again, you're not going to be you know, teaching out of you know, a Greek and Hebrew Bible, uh, even though you should know as a, as a teacher what the original language say and make your, be able to make your case exegeting the original languages. That's, that's going to take some work on your part. You need to be able to do it. Now, that said, when you get to translation theory, this is important because, uh, again, we want to make sure that we avoid violating the warnings of the Scripture, like, add not to his word lest he reprove you and you'll be found a liar, okay? Or you get to the end of the book of Revelation, you get the warning, uh, do not add to the words of the prophecy of this book, or, you know, or, or you're going to get plagues and locusts and disco and everything else added to your life. Disco, yeah, it's bad. Okay, you got that. Good. So, all right. So, all that to say is, is that the, tra the Bible translators have a very, very important job. I mean, all of us have an important job, but you're, you're, you're to take the Word of God and make sure you're not changing it. You're not adding to it. You're not deleting it. Uh, I mean, you, you should go into that with fear and trembling, okay? And with a whole lot of, uh, again, reverence and humility, seeking the advice of others. So all that said is going into this, you've got a couple of assumptions in place, okay? For example, um, Old and New Testament textual criticism, which we talked about in the last module, it assumes that you've already done your work. You know the Bible's inspired and errant, but you also know as far as which Old Testament verses are, are actually the accurate ones. Which ones should I use in my translation of the variants? Okay. Same thing with the New Testament. You know, if you're Old Testament, Biblia Hebraica Stuckartensia, whatever the latest edition is, that's the that. Technically, it's the standard for most Bible translators. But then you get to the New Testament, you've got different manuscript families that become the basis for it. Do I go majority text? Do I go critical text? What do I use as the basis for the translation? So that's, 
That's number one. You'll find out a lot of modern translations are using the UBS, Nestle Elan as, as a critical text. Uh, and by that, you know, those who are, who are translating the New King James and others, uh, again, they look what is commonly called majority text, but it's a little different, but I've covered that in the uh, textual criticism module. But all that to say, you've got to have that in place, but now, I've got to have people be able to study the Word of God in their own language. Now, Martin Luther, he was one of the first who was able, he translated the Bible into the language of the people, uh, into the common German. That is one of his great accomplishments. Uh, we have John Wycliffe, for example, is you know, one of the original authors of the English Bible. We've been building on that ever since. So, so based on that, just real briefly, and you're going to read a lot about this in, again, in Geisler and Nix, and I believe Dr. Price uh, briefly touches on this, but the concept of translation, you got two basic theories, okay? Uh, uh, you either have formal equivalence or dynamic equivalence, okay? Uh, start with the latter. Dynamic equivalence is you're trying to really understand what the propositions of Scripture are saying and try and translate that exactly propositionally or conceptually into the, uh, the target language, like the English language. So, uh, so there, for example, you can't really follow exactly the word order in the exact words because the argument would be it wouldn't make sense or wouldn't be as clear to the reader in the new language. So that's the dynamic equivalence idea. And there, for example, one example here, which again, they're, they're both good, depending on the usability, but actually I'll give you the example later. Formal equivalence uh, is more the idea of trying to keep as much as possible a one-for-one -one correspondence of the words and the word order of the original language, bring it over into the target translation language like English, and let the interpreter and expositor explain what it means. Okay? Now, which, by the way, all translations that are out there in the English-speaking world right now, and I'm not as familiar with Spanish or any other language, but in the English-speaking world, we've got lots of really good translations. Some more emphasize dynamic equivalence, like the New International Version. Some more emphasize formal equivalence, like the ESV or the NASB. So, that said, uh, the fact is we have to remember that all translations are going to include both formal equivalent translations and dynamic equivalent, uh, but there's going to be an emphasis on one or the other. And I'm going to give you an example here of formal and dynamic equivalence, and that would be, for example, just look at um, uh, you look at Philippians two, the great passage about the humiliation of Christ. He says, "Although we existed in the form of God, uh, God." He did not regard equality with, the, with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking, uh, taking the form of a bondservant, being made in the likeness of men. Okay? Now, it's very important here that, see, that's a formal equivalence or NASB type of translation of that passage. So what does it mean that although we existed in the form of God? Because you look at the Greek text on that, and you, you see that, well, the words there are, you know, huparkon, you know, en morphe and theu. Well, what does that actually mean? Well, if you do a more formal equivalent translation, it means, you know, huparkon, present active participle, he continues to exist in the morphe, the form, theu, of God. But what does that mean conceptually? Well, form of God, as it's understood, is the outward expression of innermost nature. So the concept being expressed there, he continues to exist being in very nature God. That's why you get to a more dynamic equivalent translation like the NIV. And the NIV has it being in very nature God, he follow the rest of the passage. So that would be an example of the difference of, again, a formal equivalence and dynamic equivalence in the translation. And again, now the extremes to avoid in formal equivalence, remember what's emphasized is word order uh, as much as possible and trying to keep as many of the original words as a one-to-one -one correspondence. Well, to go over the top on that, what do you have? You have an interlinear, okay? 
where you've got the Greek text or the Hebrew text and a literally one-to-one -one word correspondence. And if any of you have actually actually uh, <laughs> read an interlinear before, you get to some of the passages and scratch your head. Like you get to the New Testament, you get to the idiomatic uses. Um, this is when you get to idioms, for example, in language. Uh, you get where, for example, the demoniac accounts, uh, you, you get this phrase, and you see this multiple places in the New Testament. But for example, the, the demons say to Christ, now the dynamic, you know, the idiomatic translation, dynamic equivalent translation is, you know, what do, you, what do we have to do with you, son of God, if you come to torment us before the day? But if you look at the literal Greek, it's what to me and to you, okay? That makes no sense whatsoever if you translated it literally, but that's an idiomatic use of, you know, Koine Greek in the New Testament era. But what it means, what do we have in common? What do you want from me? Okay, so you can't do a word-for-word -word translation there, it wouldn't make sense. So again, the extreme to go beyond formal equivalence is interlinear. And then to go beyond dynamic equivalence, trying to get a proposition for proposition translation is really to go to paraphrases. Because the fact is God inspired each and every word of the text. Uh, as we see, and, and again, we'll cover this in our discussions in Inspiration and Inerrancy, people, Jesus and the apostles, for example, are relying on one word sometimes in Scripture to make a case for their argument. So that's why the idea of verbal plenary inspiration, each and every word is inspired. You know, for Jesus makes the argument, for example, you know, uh, when he's arguing with his antagonist, uh, in, this, in, in John, he says, well, basically the argument, you're just saying, hey, seven brides for seven brothers, right? Which one's wife in the resurrection? He says, you don't understand the scriptures of the power of God. He says, because he says, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Present tense, not past tense. He's still the I am. So in other words, you know, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, when God's talking to Moses at the burning bush, he's talking about patriarchs that have been dead now, you know, for 500, 600, 700 years. He says, I still am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's not the God of the dead, but of the living. He relies on the verb tense there, of, of, again, of one word. So we see that too with seed versus seeds uh, and all of that. So this is why you get into danger zone when you get to paraphrases. See, paraphrases, unfortunately, they, they, in, in many say you can, they're not really Bible translations at that point. They're sort of overview sermons of a passage. And so the question is, is well, but did this person who claims to be the translator sermonator actually interpret it and communicate it correctly? So I think we, what we want to avoid, again, are you can't really preach through interlinears and, and paraphrases. You might want to make the case that they're not really in and of themselves Bible translations. So we're going to go somewhere between formal and dynamic equivalents in just about everything we use. So again, that said, you're going to look a lot on this in the Geisler and Nick's text, and you're going to have to decide at some point on what a standard text is for your people. And final words on this. Remember, we're, we're going to hide God's word in our heart. Fact is, get a good translation if they're hiding it in their heart, because there's some pretty bad wooden translations out there. Uh, again, the King James, the new King James is still great. It's still very, it's, you know, the diction is thundering. It's majestic. Uh, there are a lot of things about it. it I'll tell you though, because beauty in a translation, as much as accuracy, uh, as well as good diction, as, and so on and so forth, can be very, very important to capture, again, the beauty, majesty, importance, and authority of the Word of God. Anyway, I'll uh, see you again uh, when we talk about uh, Sola Scriptura in the next section, Insufficiency and Clarity. Thanks.